This is The Fit Mess with Zach and Jeremy. Well, here's an episode I'm sure nobody can relate to. Stress, anxiety, and what to do about sending our kids back to school. I mean, nobody's going through all that, right? I'm turning the show off right now. <laughs> well, it's not applicable. Welcome to The Fit Mess. My name is Jeremy. His name is Zach. What's up, everyone? And as we look forward to, or in many of your cases, your kids are already back to school, and whatever that looks like, we're getting ready to send our kids back to school, whatever that looks like, and trying to manage all of the emotions and feelings and thoughts and, and everything that goes into all that, that's on top of the normal level of anxiety. And for Zach, I know for you lately, it's just been through the roof. So my anxiety is so bad. Like There's different levels. Like You can get to one level of anxiety where it it actually drives you where you're worried about something so much that you'll take care of it and take care of it and take care of it. Mm -hmm. And then there's another step further where you get into like crippling anxiety, which is where I am, where you worry so much that you just have to avoid it. Like there's nothing you can do. Like taking care of the action is, is anxious as well. Is so it because, to, is it because there's literally nothing you can do about the source of the anxiety or you're just so crippled by the anxiety that you can't take those action steps. You're just so crippled by the anxiety. Wow. Yeah. It's on a day that I get a lot of things done. If I have like a really good day where I've just fought through it and worked with it, like I get, I get done. I'm at the end of the day and I am like, I fall asleep on the couch. Like I am just exhausted and it mm -hmm. could just be talking. We're not talking physical labor here. We're talking just, yeah. you know, like, go to a meeting and have, you know, like nothing strenuous, but the, the amount of energy that I burn through just getting my ass to do something uh -huh. is incredible. I'm laughing because, you know, given the choice between digging a ditch or going to a meeting, I'll dig three ditches before I go to a meeting because no good <laughs> ever comes from a meeting ever. Um, uh, I, it's funny. Mine, mine, it's that sounds familiar because mine on the on the flip side I'm more the depressed side and I have the same thing where the depression either either overwhelm becomes depression or the depression becomes overwhelm and I just completely shut down. I can't feel, I can't I, I can function, right? Like I can move through the day. I can walk down the street, you know, this this just happened. I was with my kids up at the beach. I can walk from the house to the beach. But from there, it's like, kids, you got to just play. I can't, I, I don't want to be here. I, I don't want to do, to do anything. Mm -hmm. So like the idea of getting down in the sand and making a sandcastle or, you know, or whatever the hell it is that, that kids like to do for fun, mm -hmm. just not, not going to happen. I, it's just not in me. And I had this sort of weird realization uh, during that trip where, you know, I, I kept escaping into my phone because I just was like, I, I don't know how to manage this. That is a, a mindless activity. I can escape this feeling and just look at information. And this article popped up that was like, are you are you suffering from burnout? Something like that. Mm -hmm. And so I read what, you know, like sort of the scientific explanation of burnout. I mean, we all get burned out on whatever, but like the actual clinical definition of burnout. And it was just every word was a red flag for the way I was mm -hmm. feeling. And I realized like in doing that, I was having a quiet moment, uh, listening to myself, trying to figure out what my issue was, and that's when I found it. And those times are so rare when you're cooped up in your house with your family, working, doing all the things. Unless you carve out the time to peel yourself away from all of the responsibilities you're dealing with all of the time, you never have time to just hear yourself think and and process what you need to process to to move past that feeling of inaction where you can't do anything. Is that, does that ring any bells on the anxiety side? Um, some of them. Yeah. So you mentioned overwhelm and that is probably the number one feeling that I get. And, and again, on our, on our newsletter, I talked a little bit about trying to get a little bit more organized because if I, if I do have too much to do, if I haven't dumped it all out onto a piece of paper or something like that, mm -hmm. Um, I, I can't figure out where to go or where to, where to start things. Right. So I think that's kind of the same and, thing. I, I yeah. Think and and that it gets inventory. to a point where I just shut down. Yeah. Oh, okay. So, and, so at that point, once you process and get everything out, that's when you shut it. Cause is it because you can see in front of you the mountain? Uh, no. So one, 
before I process, that's when I shut down. So okay. if I don't process everything and do my, my brain dump where, I mean, I, I'll, once a week, I'll just sit down and write for 10. <laughs> <laughs> I don't know why every time one of us says brain dump, we both laugh. I know. <laughs> Um, I'll just sit down for 10 minutes and write everything that comes out of my mind. And it's just any thought, like it doesn't even have to be a task. It can be a feeling or something I have to do later, or just, you know, a reminder to myself or some gratitude piece. Right. And I just sit there and write for 10 minutes and this big list. And I usually fill up the paper. And once I get it out, then I can start slotting things over Mm -hmm. to this is what I need to do today. This is what I need to plan for tomorrow. Right. This is what I need to delegate to somebody else. These are the things I need to stop worrying about and just get rid of. Right. And that's for like, and then you break it down into individual projects, right? So like, you know, something along the lines of like, you know, clean the patio would be on there, right? But within clean the patio, there's, I got to get the pressure washer out. I got to get the soap stuff out. I got to get the screwdriver so I can scrape all the moss. I got to fix the stairs. I got like, like it just, each individual thing is all these tasks and if i can't get them out and organized somewhere and figure out what's step number one what's step number two it's like the tasmanian devil in my head and i just whoop shut off and i will go do something else look at my phone facebook whatever and just completely forget that that thing was ever a thing that i had to do that is funny because for me when if it is something that i can visualize okay i gotta go you know I'll just say mow the lawn, even though I haven't mowed my own lawn in years. I don't, I don't break it down like that. I just go, I got to go mow the lawn. And so then I'll take the action of get up and go get the lawnmower. But like, if I thought about, okay, I've got to put on safe shoes so that I can go outside, get the key to the shed to get the lawnmower. Like if I broke it down like that in my head before doing it, I w- it would never get done. I And it's funny because that is such a huge source of frustration for me because I will go do some project I was trying to fix that I we talked about on the show I was trying to fix this stupid leaking faucet thing I'll just go start doing it and then fail because I didn't think through here's all the things I need to do this right so then I'll do it wrong I'll get pissed I'll break something Mm -hmm. so I can't I can't process it like you because I would never take the action but by not processing it like you I take the action and I do it wrong and then have to fix it and do it the right way so I don't know what's worse, frankly. In in both cases, it's just a shitload of work that uh, is frustrating and exhausting. And that, and that's why we're so active on social media lately. <laughs> it's true. We can't stop. Yeah. the The problem for me is like so something like mowing the lawn, like you mentioned. Like mm. I've done that a hundred times, right? That's routine. That's easy. Okay. It's usually the new things, which is weird because like my entire career has been based on my ability to manage extremely complex situations in an emergency. When I don't have time to think about my anxiety, no problem. Like if I just have to make the decision and move on and move on and move on and move on, there's no problem. So, I mean, if I just dealt with my entire life as if it was the entire server room was on fire, I'd be good. (laughs) But I think you wouldn't necessarily, I mean, you would make more mistakes probably, but you would get closer to being done than by thinking it through to death. Yeah. And that's, you know, it's it's funny. My wife and I, most of the arguments that we have are about, I can't talk about this anymore. Like whatever, whatever the thing is, like she, she's much more like you where she likes to think everything through and every possible outcome. And I like to just jump in the pool and see how cold the water is. So Mm -hmm. when we have to have these discussions about how is this thing going to go? I'm like, I, I can't do that. My brain cannot do that. I need to just take the step. And Mm -hmm. it's funny that that most of our our arguments uh, are based in that. See, and that's where empathy comes in. You need to, you need to look at it from her side and understand how her brain's processing it. Mm -hmm. And if you can adapt to that happy wife, happy life, sir. (laughs) It's true. It's true. But that's, and again, but that's me and my anxiety and I have to manage that appropriately. I spent years trying to make my anxiety go away and that just made it worse, right? Mm -hmm. I had to embrace it and acknowledge it and make it my friend Mm -hmm. and 
you know, be grateful for it and say, thank you for thinking of all the things that I wouldn't think of. Right. Right. And, and acknowledge it. And once I, once I can acknowledge it, once I, you know, I have this aha moment at least once a day when I'm looking at some task that I've never done before. And I pull my phone out without even thinking about it Mm -hmm. to like check Facebook. And I have to put it down, have a conversation with myself and say, Hey, you know what? Thank you for being worried. Mm -hmm. That's great. We got to get this done. So let's, let's put the things in place. Let's get a piece of paper. Let's start writing everything down. Let's write the worries down, put them in the right place and take the first step. So for me, like I just have to embrace it, acknowledge it and work forward with it. But my anxiety, well, a good portion of it is genetic. It was shaped heavily by the way I was raised. Right. So my daughter who's going back to school here in a couple of weeks, she also has the genetic side of the anxiety. So she's got the little worry brain. She's not being raised the way I was. Right. Right. I've, I've very purposefully broke that chain, which I believe went back, you know, centuries in my, on my mother's side. Sure. I've broken the chain. So she has the worry, but it's not the same anxiety that I have, but at the same time, it needs to be addressed. And um, I recognize that she has it. So going back to school is just getting to be a really anxious topic here. And we decided that um, and we flip flopped probably a dozen times. I mean, we decided she wasn't going, Mm -hmm. then we decided she was going, then we decided she wasn't going. Right. And, you know, my wife and I were just actually, I take that back. My wife was always like, okay, that's the decision. And then the next day I'd be like, well, you know, I was thinking about it more (laughs) and I'm, you know, but ultimately we we had a deadline of when we had to sign her up and we decided to send her back to school. We're in New York. Rates are relatively low. The school here is actually doing a great job. They've moved an entire grade out to another school. There was a whole wing that was for um, special needs kids that they've moved out to another another school. So they actually have the room for all the kids to be, you know, six to 10 feet apart while they're at their desks. Wow. And they'll be it'll be really awkward um, for them to be there like that, but they have the space to be safe. And they're going to wear masks all day long as children Mm. in a school. And they're going to wear masks all day long. So, Uh. um, you know what? I have a feeling (laughs) that, you know, all the schools around here have all their, their policies in place where if, if there is one case at a school, that school goes virtual for two weeks. Okay. No questions asked. Right. One of the things that I learned is that we've got a bunch of friends here who are teachers and they don't teach in the same district that they live in because they don't want to run into families where they live. And that makes total sense, right? You want to go out and enjoy your, your personal life. So one of the things that a lot of schools around here are not doing is they're not allowing substitutes. Right. So if your teacher has to take time off or go somewhere else, that class goes completely virtual. Wow. So if you think about that and you have one case at one school where, say, a teacher who's teaching in a different district, their school closes, that teacher has to go home to take care of their kids. Mm -hmm. And then those kids have to go home and then those parents have to go home and those like it's just going to be a domino domino effect. effect. Totally. So and you know that there will be a case within. Three to four hours. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, it's just going to happen. So. (laughs) So because our my daughter's school is relative, you know, the, the plan is good. It's a safe environment for the most part. And my guess is that she's going to be home soon anyway. Mm-hmm. We we did do the final decision where we're going to send her because I, I think at the fourth grade level, that social interaction with the teacher is really important, right? Mm-hmm. She's just missing out on certain base level skills that for if sure. she doesn't get them now, she's going to, it's going to be a problem. Yeah. Here. Uh, we, we weren't really wrestling with a decision because we were kind of waiting for the school board to make their decision. They've, they'd been saying for months, you know, we we plan to go back probably a couple of days a week, every other day, whatever, various programs, but there was never a consistent message that that was the case, that that's what was going to happen. So we both just kind of said, let's wait and see what they decide and then make our decision from there. And as time's gone on and, you know, we get no closer to a vaccine or a cure or a plan because there's no leadership on this issue. We, we made the the call before the district that we're just not sending our kid back. Like if that means that we need to go full homeschool, whatever, but we're not doing it because there's no leadership on this issue and it's not w- worth the risk 
to our kids' health, to our health, to our parents' health, to the to the domino effect that would be created by our kids bringing that into our house and trying to figure out how to you know eradicate it from spreading beyond that. Mm-hmm. So fortunately, the decision has been made for us, and the district is going to go all online to start anyways. And one thing I think is really smart that they're considering is at least um, in some capacity offering outdoor classes so that maybe a couple of days a week, the kids can go and be outside with their friends in some relatively social and, and engaging experience. Um, great idea. And so that's great. I, I love that they're that sort of, you know, pardon the cliche, but thinking outside the box or whatever. And I, I think the the challenge for a lot of people is coming up with how to manage I think I think your case is is scarier to me for a lot of reasons but one is just the consistency issue like you guys have a lot of f- freedom in your schedule and, and the ability to, to work from home I don't think a lot of people have that mm-hmm. I think a lot of people certainly in our neighborhood um, the the neighborhood school that we our kids don't go to anymore um, but there's a huge homeless population those kids don't have computers they don't have internet so Coming up with a plan that is, hey, we're going to treat this relatively normally until something goes sideways, and then expecting an entire community to react to it suddenly going sideways, I think that's a big ask of a community, and I think that that they need a solid plan that we're just we're doing this until there's a way to know that we can change to something more stable. Mm-hmm. Um, because you and I, we can manage. If, if yeah. something goes sideways, we can okay, we can we can pivot, we can figure out a way to make it work. There are tons of people that their kids have been in day, in daycare all summer because they don't have the option. They, they work in a job where they have to be face to face with people. They have to be, you know, physically doing the job where they're doing it. You and I can sit in front of a screen and, and do our job from anywhere. So um, yeah. it, it presents just tons of challenges and, and there's no good answer. Nothing that any of us are doing is the best option for any of us. Yep. Yeah, we were going to do, we had our daughter signed up for the, the YMCA around here does like a summer camp. They couldn't officially do a camp. So they canceled it and then called it daycare at camp. Ah. So it was, you know, little, little, uh, work around, but we had her signed up. She was going to go. And then like literally the day before we, we realized that, um, and we got a, an email from the YMCA. It turns out there's like 200 families on the waiting list to get children into these daycare facilities. Wow. So, you know, on top of the worry and anxiety that we're sending our daughter out back out into the world where she could contract something and bring it home, you know, we're like, listen, we have the ability to pivot. There's other families that really need this. We would only be sending her for the social aspect of it. We don't have to send her. So we, we pulled her out of that and opened it up for other families, which was the right thing to do. Yeah. Um, but, you know, our kid has been relatively alone now for over six months. Yeah. And and going back to school again, like here in New York, it's a very different it's a very different environment where we're at. We have extremely low rates. It's relatively safe. Right. You're, and you're not in New York City. You're not even New York City has gotten it under control for the most part. But but where you guys are. Yeah. Way more there's remote. cases. Yeah. yeah. There's, there's cases, but it's super low. And, and again, the things that the school has done to, you know, make that environment as safe as possible. I'm okay with, right. It, yeah. It's they've made the room. There's plenty of room for them to be socially distanced. So for me, part of my decision is, you know, this girl has been, has been sacrificing time with friends and, and, and just that, that social interaction so that other families could take advantage of it who really needed it. Right. And, you know, going back to school, we're not taking anyone's place. We're not, you know, right. we're not, there's no other, there's no families waiting to get into this, right? This right. is her opportunity. And like I said, I think she'll be home in two to three weeks from <laughs> right. the start of school. So. Yeah, no, I agree. So making this going back to school decision has been super tough on my wife and I, but while we did not want to put the decision in our daughter's hands, mm-hmm we certainly talked to her about it and gave her the opportunity to have input into it. Mm -hmm. It's just not a decision I would be comfortable with a nine-year-old making. Right. But we did sit her down we talked with her and we, it was funny because we said, you know, 
school's coming back and we need to make a decision on whether you go or stay home virtually. And she cut us off right there and she said, I want to go. Yeah. And then we explained, you know, the pros, the cons, everything like that. And in the end, she actually said, I'd prefer to stay home. Wow. Which was, I was impressed with the, you know, listening to the reasoning, making the decision. But now, you know, and and we've talked to her how, you know, where she's going to physically go and that, you know, the decision that we made is against what she decided, what she wanted. Mm -hmm. So that adds to the anxiety. So we're really having to deal with this, this extra level of anxiety of, of managing with, we're having to help our daughter manage all of this extra anxiety about going to school, you know, something that up until now has been an exciting, fun thing for her. Mm -hmm. And now it's this scary, deathly, crazy situation. And it's just been really hard to, you know, meet all those needs at the anxiety level for what she's going through. Well, and I think it's important to, to share that with your kids too, is to share that this is causing anxiety for me too, because there is no good decision. There's, there's the less bad one for us and it's not Mm going to be the same for everybody. You know, it's so interesting because even before this, school was a, a source of anxiety for me because of all the shootings that happen in this country at, at schools. Every every single day that I dropped my kid off at school, part of me went, I might not see her again. Mm-hmm. That's taken my kid to school in America. And now you yeah, add this layer, you know, I mean, the, the I guess the upside is there haven't been any school shootings because of coronavirus. So solved that true. problem. But um, for now. But yeah, I, I think it's important to, that that we involve our kids. We did the same thing. We had the same conversation and and asked for feedback. And ultimately we, we all agree that it's just, we, we don't have to, so we shouldn't take the risk. And so that's, Mm -hmm. that's, that's how we came to that conclusion. Yeah. And your situation in Seattle is vastly different than upstate New York. Sure. Yeah. I mean, densely populated, populated area, densely populated school. Yeah. There's just, there's a lot of aspects to consider. So with all that in mind, we were fortunate enough to speak with Dr. Harvey Karp. Uh, you might know him from his books, uh, The Happiest Baby on the Block, Happiest Toddler on the Block. In raising our kids, he was instrumental in figuring out how to communicate with them and how to manage a lot of the, the whining and the crises that come up when you're, when you're raising kids. He's, he's just a brilliant guy and has lots of great advice on how to help our kids and, and how to understand what they're going through as they prepare to either go back to school or go back to school in your living room. Uh, So we had a chance to talk to him about what's going on with our kids and how we can help them through this very difficult time. If you can paint a picture for me, what's going on inside that kid's mind right now, because this is, this is uh, an underlying stress that I know affects me as a, you know, relatively functional adult all day long, every day. Uh, You know, these are kids that are used to going to the park and playing with their friends and going to school and and all these things. And all of it overnight was ripped away. What's going on inside uh, our kids' minds? Yeah, you know, you you hit the nail on the head. This is so challenging for them um, because it's a total disruption of their lives. We can kind of, you know, we can kind of adapt, but... um, uh, it's really, really disruptive, and especially for the toddlers. Um, school-age kids, you know, it's hard on them. Teenagers, of course, it's hard on them, but they've got FaceTime and other ways of connecting and other ways of learning. But the little toddlers, kids anywhere from, you know, a year to four and five, they're totally upended. And I got to say this about parents. You know, you guys, um, I think, will appreciate this, but there's never been a time in the history of humanity, where parents have been locked up with little children in small contained areas, and they haven't been able to go outside and play with the other kids or let the children run after the chickens or, you know, basically be normal kids. I mean, even in times of pestilence, you were locked indoors with your extended family and you had other children around and it was entertaining for the children. Um, So it is a very abnormal time and parents should pat themselves on the back because being home with the doors locked and having to, especially if you don't have a backyard and you're kind of stuck in an apartment, that has never happened throughout the history of humanity. So kudos to everybody who's doing that. 
that's the first statement. The second part of this is that um, the way I like to look at it, at least, is that little children, toddlers rather, are not little children. Toddlers are cavemen. They're primitives. They are un frickin civilized. And you really learn that when you're locked in a room with them. And I don't mean to be disrespectful at all. I love toddlers, but they're not civilized. They don't understand the rules of, of civil life. They don't have, they're not reliable for saying please and thank you and waiting in line and sharing their toys and washing their dishes after themselves. You know, they're very self-centered and they, it's me, me, me. And all the time they're egocentric. And so if you're alone with a young child, it's demanding 24 hours a day around the clock, middle of the night, waking up. So it's very tough. And these children just need, um, they need um, diversion and they need um, novelty to kind of keep them interested. But there are several things that parents can do to make their lives easier and to help reduce the stress in their children. And so I want to just give you a few of these. And this is mostly taken out of uh, a book that I wrote called The Happiest Toddler on the Block, which, which talks about emotional resilience in children starting at around eight months up to about mm, 79 years of age. Because honestly, <laughs> we all become toddlers, you know, at a certain point when we get emotionally distraught. Um, so here's a few things for parents to think about and to practice. Number one, routines and rituals. The little kids can't tell time. They don't know how close they're getting to lunch, how close they're getting to dinner. Um, uh, bedtime, maybe they can see the lights getting dim outside and that's a cue for them. But they need help in predicting the day. Preschool teachers are great at this because they have the songs, they're preparing kids what's coming up next. There's a routine that helps young children understand what is what they can expect in the day. So write a, write a little schedule for yourself and your child. What do you do when you wake up? What do you do before lunch? And, and drop into that schedule little rituals. And by rituals, I mean tiny little behaviors that are very, very um, um, repetitive and true to form. So for example, before you have lunch, um, have your lunch song. It's lunch time. It's lunch, lunch, lunch time. I mean, it doesn't matter what your song is. As long as you do the same thing, do it before you get dressed, do it before you eat breakfast, do a lunch song, do a brushing teeth song. Those silly little things help your child feel like a participant. It helps them feel security. And that's the key word here. When you understand things, when it's not chaotic and unexpected, you feel more secure. Um, so routines and rituals help you do that. And there are all sorts of routines you can have. You can have reading time. You can have art time. You can have outside dig in the mud time. You can have collect leaves time. You can have let's water the seeds time. This is, uh, or cook with me time, so that, you know, everyone's thinking about academics. But I wouldn't think about this as a period for teaching children academically. I mean, of course, that's fine, and it's great to have in-home learning and things like that. This is kind of more like an extended summer vacation where, um, you know, cut yourself some slack. It's okay if you watch a little bit more television and use the video. I mean, don't, don't be so tough on yourselves and your child because you're under extreme stress right now. And um, don't, I mean, it's great to do academics, but if your kid loves that, that's fantastic. If your child doesn't love that, don't sweat it. Do other types of participatory events that your child will be learning from anyway. Like how do we measure the flour before we cook the cookies? You know, how do we water the plants and know if it's too wet or not wet enough? Um, how do we, um, organize leaves in terms of the biggest to the littlest and put it in a book and how do we tape it so it doesn't fall out or all sorts of little things. Again, this is not easy. I, I don't mean to make it sound easy. And, and if, if you're lucky enough to have a partner or have other older kids in the family, rotate the responsibilities um, so that it doesn't all fall on one person's shoulders. Um, one more thing is meditation practices. Now, it's not easy to get a two-year-old to meditate, um, but um, people also call this mindfulness or balancing practice. And there is a technique I like a lot called magic breathing, 
which is just where you're kind of like a conductor with your hands in the air, conducting your child's breathing in and breathing out. And you do your own as well. So your fingers go up in the air and you breathe in and then they come down and you breathe out. And you do like two breaths or three breaths. The trick here is to breathe out longer than you're breathing in. That's how breathing becomes relaxing. And parents also can go on apps like um, Headspace and Calm, and there are specific little exercises that you can do with kids to help them learn how to be mindful and meditate. Because if they learn how to be able to calm their excitement, then during the day you can get them all excited, but you can practice calming as well so that they're better able to control their own you know, outbursts of, um, of emotion. I love that the, uh, the habits and the rituals, we, we put together one for my daughter and we gave her input on, how, on what was gonna be on that, that, um, that schedule. And she decided she wanted to bake things every morning at nine o'clock which Love sounded it. great Love in the it. beginning. It, it's been very difficult to maintain that consistency. It's a lot of work to do at nine o'clock. But here's what's great that, that you did. Um, I really appreciate that because you talked to her and you involved her in the decision-making. And you can have what they call a family meeting once a week where you say, what are we doing? This worked, this didn't work. Let's you know, retool what we're doing. You know what, honey, that's a great idea, but let's do it at three in the afternoon because it's too hard at nine in the morning. What should we do instead at nine in the morning? Should we organize your drawers? Should we do, you know, um, should we make granola? Should we fix breakfast? You want to help me pour the milk? You can figure out something else to substitute in there. Right. Yeah. It's, I think we're, we're getting into a good ritual. I think at nine, we're, we're, we're starting to get it down. I think we, uh, this morning there was fresh banana bread by 10, 30, 11 o'clock. So I, I, I was kind of okay with that. Um, I wanted to, I wanted to switch a little bit with you here. I know we, we touched a little bit on it earlier, but um, my daughter is eight and we had to, you know, basically explain why um, COVID-19 was so serious. And, you know, one of the, one of the ways that we, we had to do it was um, to tell her that, you know, if mom and dad got sick, you know, who would take care of you kind of thing. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of negative emotions that, you know, my daughter's mm -hmm. processing that I think a lot of other kids are processing. And, and um, you know, I, I'm very interested in your take on, you know, how parents can manage those negative emotions and have those conversations with the kids without, you know, quite literally scaring them to death like I did with my daughter. Sure. No, I mean, that's a great question. And I, you know what I think about when I think about explaining things like this to kids? It's like shooting an arrow at a target. Um, when you shoot an arrow at a target, you don't just consider the target. You have to consider the wind. Um, and so when you're explaining serious things to little kids, I mean, you want to be as honest and, and transparent as possible, but you do have to consider how they interpret things and their level of, of um, anxiety and fear. And you have to consider your particular child. Some of them, it goes in one ear and out the other, and others are really kind of thoughtful about it and they can kind of, um, you know, labor over it and, and uh, kind of mull it over and over inside their mind. So those are things that kind of change the way you might explain something to one child versus another. But I think the key concept here, and it kind of ties into the rituals and routines business, is that you don't only want to explain the risk and why we're doing these, you know, these things that we never did before, but here are the things that we're doing to stay strong and healthy and safe. And so hand washing um, to get rid of the germs. And there are great little videos online that there was one where someone wears gloves and they put ink on their hands or something black on their hands and show how the ink is like washing their hands, how you have to wash completely and thoroughly to make sure that you're, you're getting every part of the hand. Um, another thing is um, singing, you know, happy birthday when you're washing your hands, which again is a silly little thing, but it makes you feel like you're doing something and you're in control. Um, taking vitamins every day, doing three push-ups to keep your body strong, um, you know, making sure you're going, you're getting sleep because sleep is the most important vitamin for your immune system. Um, eating, you know, vegetables because vegetables are good for your body. I mean, things like that. So that even though you had to give a tough message to her, 
all day long, she's getting new messages, which is this is how we stay safe and strong and healthy. And then one other little trick that this is another one of these happiest toddler techniques is called gossiping. So when you want to give your child praise or criticism or important information, of course, you say it directly to your child. But little kids have big ears and they love overhearing you talking about other things, um, especially if it's about them. And so you can whisper to your to your to your spouse or pretend to be talking to grandma on the telephone and uh, literally whisper it so that you almost seem like you don't want to be overheard, but you can whisper some of the things you're doing to stay strong and your child will overhear that. And when you overhear, like if I told you, Hey, Zach, you look great today. You know, you're going to think, well, thank you, but I'm probably just being polite or something. But if you overhear me whispering in the hallway to Jeremy, Hey, Jeremy, Zach looks really good today. There's no ulterior motive there. You, you're more likely to believe it. So you can make your praise or your criticism or underscore the points you want to make and make them five times more, um, uh, more impactful for your child if you gossip about it in addition to saying it directly to your child. That's, that's amazing. I'm going to try that tonight. <laughs> <laughs> I'll tell you for for me that worked that worked like a charm with uh, my nine year old when she was uh, still a toddler. It's it's an amazing uh, technique. I want to make one more very actionable point um, that I think can be helpful for for parents whose kids have anxiety, um, and um, from little kids to grown up kids to teenagers or or whatever. So, um, and that has to do with how we acknowledge feelings. And there's a huge misunderstanding that parents have about acknowledging feelings or dealing with their child when they have anxieties. Most of us as loving parents want to help our kids, right? We want them not to be upset and not to be fearful. And so we'll very quickly um, reassure them. Um, with little kids, sometimes we very quickly distract them into something else. Um, which kind of is something we would hate if someone did that to us, right? If you said, you know, I'm really worried about this. And I say, oh, don't worry about that at all. That's nothing to worry about. That feels so dismissive. And if I just try to distract you with, uh, do you want more to eat? That feels totally ignoring of our concerns. So it's not that reassurance is bad or that distraction is bad. They're both fine, but they're not the first thing you do. The first thing you do is you acknowledge feelings. And this is where people mess it up all the time. Out of their good hearts and their love, they're doing something that actually is unhelpful and even harmful to their children. When you acknowledge feelings, you think, most of us think that means saying words. Honey, listen, I know you're upset. I know you got worried. And you can't see me right now because we're on radio, but I'm holding up my hand kind of in a stop signal. Like, honey, it's okay, sweetheart, calm down, calm down. It's okay. Daddy's going to make everything better. That is not acknowledging feelings. That is patronizing, and ultimately the child never really feels fully heard. There's only one way to acknowledge feelings, and anyone can do it, and it's by repeating the concern and doing it in a technique I call toddler ease, which it's kind of the language of little kids, short phrases, repetition, and mirroring a third of their emotion. So short phrases, repetition, mirroring a third of their emotion. So even with a nine, nine-year-old, you would do this. So when she says, Daddy, I'm really, really scared, you say, oh, my gosh, honey, I can see that on your face. I know that you're scared. I mean, this is you don't like what I was telling you. It's a scary thing to hear. And I'm so sorry, honey, because I know I can see on your face that it's concerning to you. And I don't want to worry you because I want you to feel confident and, and daddy's fine and mommy's fine. But I can really, really see how this is, you know, I can see how this is something that's been been bothering you. I just repeated that like seven times. But it feels honest and genuine. And once I see her relaxing a little bit, then I get to my agenda, which is the reassurance and the explanation or exploring it a little bit more. What made you think that, honey? Or what, what is it that you're worried about 
specifically? Are you worried that mommy and daddy could get hurt? Or are you worrying that your little brother could get hurt? Or are you worrying about grandma? Or I don't understand exactly. Can you help me understand? Because a whole world will then open up to you and they will explain things that you couldn't have possibly guessed at. Now, it turns out that we normally do this technique when kids, when they're very happy. In other words, when they're happy, we don't say, uh, very good, father is proud. I'm glad to see you're so happy. <laughs> I mean, you would never do that. You go, yay, that's great. Look at you, you try to, mm, this banana bread is so delicious. That's really yummy. You were working hard at that, huh, honey? You were measuring everything and you mashed the bananas and you did all of it and you did it so fast. I mean, God, in 15 minutes, you had that all put together. Give me five, that's a good job. We do that naturally when kids have positive feelings. But when they're frightened, angry, frustrated, we become these little armchair psychologists and we try to quickly reassure them, get them off of their feelings. Ultimately, it's only by expressing feelings with someone that we love that we get past our feelings and that we get to a healthier state. And so this technique, it's called the fast food rule, um, which you can look it up on our website, uh, happiestbaby.com, a little blog on the fast food rule. And we call it the fast food rule, not because it's about hamburgers, but because the concept is whoever is hungriest for attention gets to go first. Um, and then you use this toddlerese technique and you will be so much more effective at reassuring your child's um, concerns and anxieties. Um, I, want, I want to look a little, a little bit into the future and when these kids start going back to normal and, and society starts to look a little bit more familiar, uh, how hard is that transition going to be for them? And is there something we should keep in mind as we start easing back into uh, something more normal? Um, that's a real, that's like the $64,000 question. I think that um, we don't really know. And I think the big concern is that uh, we will have flattened the curve, but we will have elongated it. And so people will still be at risk of getting COVID-19 um, uh, if they haven't gotten it already. And so I think that we're going to see a very spotty re-entrance into society and ultimately, hopefully, and this is where the federal government has to help us, we have to get more testing done so people can know if they've already been sick, maybe they were asymptomatic, and people can have their antibody levels tested um, so that um, some of us can re-enter the workplace. And then hopefully by, you know, by coming months, we're going to have treatments that are effective. So even if you do get sick, you can be treated. So it's not uh, such a serious problem. You can get immunity and get on with your life and we can all get back to work. And, and how do we uh, help our kids integrate back into their, their social structures? Is that, is that something that's just going to come naturally, do you think? Or is that going to take some easing in? Well, I mean, kids, you know, need to be in their environment. Once we, you know, like if you have a best friend or your child is a best friend who's been tested and they already had the virus and they have immunity and your child hasn't gotten the virus yet, well, then you don't have to worry about playing with that kid. That kid can come over as much as they want because they're immune. And so um, that's where, as we get more testing um, capabilities, we'll be able to start developing a little bit more of a normal lifestyle for our children. So one of the things Dr. Karp mentioned during the interview was meditation. And that's something that I really need to, I think just a 5% increase in meditation in my life would make a tremendous difference in managing all the anxiety around going back to school. So I'm going to take it on as my my own personal challenge to to increase my meditation practice. I've I've been doing the same thing. You know, I I uh, see a therapist regularly, and and he often has to remind me that the overwhelm, the depression, the anxiety, all the stuff that can weigh you down is it's the it's the murky glass of water with sediment in it that's swirling, and it's because you keep swirling it that you can't see through. You can't see a way through it, and when you actually stop and put it down and let it rest then you can see a way through and you can manage your anxiety that way. And so that's what I've been doing. It's funny, my uh, Headspace is not a sponsor or anything, but I've been a customer of theirs for a long time and my um, membership expired, right? And so they they automatically billed me the 100 bucks for the year. And 
it's not something I wanted to pay for right now. So I had to write them and, oh, sorry, I can't do it. So they, they refunded the money. But then I quickly realized like that was the fastest path to me actually meditating was this tool. It's not perfect, but it helps me do it. So I, of course, went online and found a promo code and got it for 40 bucks instead of 100. So, so I nice. re-upped, re-upped my Headspace uh, membership and um, it, does, it helps, you know, it, it's, it's cheating. It's absolutely cheating. It is absolutely not the same thing as a deep, silent meditation practice. But like I've said, I'm sure a hundred times on the show, anything is better than not doing it at all. Yeah, it's better than nothing. You're getting some benefit out of it. Yeah. So I can't recommend enough. Find an app. If if you're dealing with anxiety, you you want to incorporate meditation into your practice, find some app. Many of them are free, at least partially. So uh, it's, it's a great um, tool to manage your anxiety or your depression, your overwhelm, whatever you're going through. Yeah. And if you can't, if, if you're like me and sitting down to meditate is seriously one of the most painful things I can do to my body. <laughs> I, I don't know why. I just want to crawl out of my skin. Mm -hmm. um, I highly recommend trying yoga, right? Yep. A nice, easy, gentle flow. It doesn't even have to be complex, but as long as you're just breathing when they tell you to breathe, you're actually getting most of the benefits of meditation yep. there, but you're comfortable in your skin. Yeah. So two um, really simple tools to, to add to your tool chest as you try and manage your anxiety and Manage getting your kids back to school, even if that means they're still sitting right next to you and talking endlessly all day while watching their videos <laughs> or whatever school is offering for you. Man, it's not going to be easy. It is not going to be an easy fall. The interesting thing in the last, in the last half of um, the school year last year, the number of days that my daughter was sick and couldn't go to school went to zero. Right? Hmm, that's that so weird. weird. So weird. I never had that problem when I was a kid. Never. Yeah. Especially, I, I, I remember specifically that I faked being sick because um, Return of the Jedi was on HBO at noon oh, on yeah. like a Wednesday. I was like, <laughs> I don't feel good. And my dad knew. He oh. knew exactly what I did. I can't tell you how many times I just wanted to watch The Price is Right. <laughs> that's all I need. Yeah, I didn't, I didn't need a lot of motivation to not go to school. All right. Let's, let's yeah. be honest. All right. Well, we got to get our kids uh, packed up and make their lunches or something because school's coming. So we're going to wrap things up. Thanks so much for listening to the show. If you would like to reach out to us uh, for any reason, please do so. Our website is thefitmess.com. And through there, you can find all of our social media channels. And we look forward to talking to you again in just a couple of weeks at thefitmess.com. We know this podcast is amazing and does not seem to lack anything, but we do need a legal disclaimer. Jeremy and Zach are not doctors. They do not play them on the Internet, and even if they did play them on the Internet, they would be really bad at it. Please consult your physician prior to implementing any changes that you heard on this podcast. The listener assumes that Jeremy and Zach do not know what they are talking about and that you will do your own research on the topics talked about on this podcast.